my design goals for the yellow box was complete separation of program logic and user application data. Should I ever decide to make the yellow box a commercial product, the user should not have to be a software developer to customize it for a specific layout and CTC panel, but the entire functionality should be configurable. In video number 10, we had a look at how this is achieved for the basic configuration of Wi-Fi, clock and MQTT. Today, we continue with the configuration of buttons, turnouts and track occupancy indicators. And if you watch to the end, you will find out why I have to temporarily stop the development of the yellow box and make another exciting little device before I can finish the work on the ABS and CTC control pieces of the yellow box. Hello YouTubers and welcome to the Internet of Toy Trains. I am Hans Tanner and here is a new episode of IOTT with fresh ideas about how to use the Internet of Things along with sensors and microcontrollers to control a model railroad layout. So, get on board! The train is leaving the station. Let's get started with a closer look at the technical concept. Besides the runtime data, the yellow box software consists of two parts. One is the program logic and the other part is the configuration data. The program logic resides in the program memory of the ESP32. To change it or to fix a bug in the program, the ESP32 needs to be reprogrammed. The configuration data, on the other hand, resides in a part of the memory that can be modified on the fly. It is stored in a normal file which can be uploaded using the onboard web server. And this configuration file contains all the information about buttons, turnouts, block detectors and the LEDs on the CTC panel that should be activated in whatever case. And it is readable for humans as well. So let's have a look into it. We can access it by pointing a web browser to the yellow box and loading the sensors.config file. On your screen you will then see the configuration data in JSON format. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It is a lightweight format for storing and transporting data. Now to me this looks awfully complex and it is. It is not something that you would like to enter using your keyboard. However, you probably would like to understand what is in there. So let me walk you through it quickly. The first section is a list of colors that are being used for the LED display. Each color consists of a name and values for RGB, red, green and blue. The fourth value is either zero for a steady display or a period length if the LED should be blinking. The next section defines the basic operation modes of the CTC panel. I will explain this in detail a little later in this video. The next section has a list of the buttons. For each button it is defined whether it is a touch, digital or analog input and what LEDs should be used to display the button status. The next section has the block detector definitions. Here it is specified what LEDs should be activated if the corresponding block is occupied and what color should be used for occupied and free. Next are turnouts, followed by signals. It all follows the same logic. You probably have figured it out by now. And if you would like to study this some more, you can download the current configuration file of my CTC panel from my GitHub page. The link is in the description below. The more convenient way to deal with all this data is letting the computer do it. So let's have a look into the configuration screen that facilitates setting all this data. And not only that, but it also makes sure that the data that is sent to the yellow box is actually in the correct format. So let me walk you through the configuration screens for the LED chain, input buttons, block detectors, turnouts and signals. The first thing to define is the number of LEDs in the CTC panel LED chain. As you remember from video number 9, all LEDs are in one long chain and can be individually addressed by the location in this chain. So what we enter is the number of the last LED in the chain. If you enter a too low number, you will not be able to control all LEDs. If the number is too big, some memory will be wasted for LEDs that are physically not there. Once you have entered a number, you can activate the test mode, select the color 
and click the test button to activate the specified number of LEDs. This is an easy way to verify that your number is correct. The next input is to split the switch address space into an area for turnouts and an area for signals. Signals typically use two switch addresses per mast, so it makes sense to treat signals and turnouts differently. Next, you can specify what the CTC panel should do when powering up or connecting to a digital command control system. Activate turnouts and signals if you want the CTC panel to query the statuses of the turnouts and signals that are defined on, it, on the panel. If you click block detectors, the CTC panel will send a GP on message, which causes all BDL16 boards to send the current status of their input lines. In the next section, we can define the LED colors that will be used. I figured it is much easier to define a few colors and give them names according to their purpose than having to select individual values for each LED. For example, I specify a color named Block Oc, which is used for track occupancy LEDs. To do so, I enter the desired name in the field and click Save. The color will now show up in the list box below. I can now click the color button and select the color to my liking. I normally choose a dark yellow for my track indicator LEDs. After closing the color dialog, I can click the test button and all LEDs on the panel will show the selected color. If I like it, I click save and that's it. The color can now be used by its name. In some cases, I want the LEDs on the CTC panel to blink. For example, while setting a route consisting of several switches and signals. If so, I activate the blink box and specify the duration of the blink cycle. For example, 500 milliseconds, which gives a blinking of 500 milliseconds on and 500 milliseconds off. I'm sure you get the idea, so I skip entering the other colors and let's move on. The next section is used to specify activators and LEDs for internal panel functions. The first is power. You can switch the CTC panel on and off using either a switch address or a touch button on the board, or, like I do, simply by defining an initial state after power up. So, if you enter a switch address in the switch field, you will be able to switch the panel on and off from your handheld throttle by just sending a switch command. Next, I can specify an LED for both statuses to indicate the power status. I choose to go with the same LED but different colors. Alternatively, you could use the same color but two different LEDs. The work mode and control mode inputs work the same way. Work mode supports the statuses normal and master. This tells the CTC panel what switch commands to use. In normal mode, it will use switch request, which means the CTC panel has the same priority like handheld throttles and switch commands will be ignored by the central unit if the Bushby bit is set. In master mode, the CTC panel will use switch acknowledge commands, which will always work. So this offers a powerful support for operating sessions. You simply set the Bushby bit in your command station and make the CTC panel work in master mode. As a result, turnouts can no longer be operated from handheld throttles of the engineers, but only from the CTC panel, which is the work area of the dispatcher. The control mode option is to specify what level of control over the layout the CTC panel is going to have. If set to off, all buttons are disabled with the LEDs are working. So the panel is remote controlled, so to speak. In real railroads, you find this mode of operation when a station that normally has a local authority is not manned overnight and a central control station is taking over. In normal mode, the buttons are enabled and can be used to set individual turnouts using a single button or a series of turnouts using two button activation. However, this is only setting of turnouts with no route reservation or other train movement related activities involved. In ABS mode, the CTC panel will activate signals based on block occupancy information and when in CTC mode, Two-button operation allows for setting and blocking routes and support controlled train movements. 
The final option in this screen allows specifying an analog input to control the brightness of the LEDs. The input line can be connected to a potentiometer for manual control or to a light sensor for automatic adjustment to the room brightness. It is important to know that this is for the brightness of the entire chain and the maximum brightness of an individual LED is what is specified in the assigned color. The individual values for red, green and blue are then simply scaled down using the brightness input. So, if you specify a red color with an R value of 255, it will scale from 255 down to 0, depending on the brightness value. If you specify a red with R equals 50, it will scale from 50 to 0. While this generally works well, please keep in mind that because of the scaling of each color component individually, the human eye might see a slightly different color for different brightness levels. The next screen helps to configure the input buttons. The yellow box can support up to 64 of them. To get them listed on the screen, you simply activate them on your CTC panel. If they work, they will show up and the screen will automatically assign a button mode, either touch, digital or analog. Should this pre-selection be wrong, you can override it. You then can specify one or several LEDs that should show the button status. For the touch button, there are four different statuses. Pressed, pressed and hold, release and release for more than half a second. Each status can have its own color assigned. The latest status is shown by the status indicator and the last message displayed in the message field. You can also activate the test mode and the selected LEDs will be lit on the CTC panel as you touch or press the input. If you have buttons on the screen that you do not want to use, you can click on the cancel button to make them disappear. If you click on save, all specifications will be permanently saved in the yellow box configuration and the next time the screen is loaded, the buttons will already be displayed with all the corresponding information. The block detector setup screen works in similar ways. You can simply drive a locomotive over your layout and all block detectors will be listed on the screen. For each block detector, you then can specify the corresponding LEDs as well as colors for occupied and free. The test checkbox allows you to simulate the yellow box operation and display block occupancy on the CTC panel as block detector statuses change. So I think this is really easy and quite intuitive to set up. Also here, you can eliminate unused block detectors with a click on the cancel button and clicking on save will write the information into the yellow box which then will take care of displaying occupancy autonomously. No surprise, the turnout screen works the very same way. To get a list of the turnouts, simply issue commands to each of them and they will be displayed on the screen. Then specified position LEDs and colors for thrown and closed position, the same way you did for the block detectors. Also, Turnouts can have buttons assigned to them, which can be specified on the right side of the status indicators. The first button is used to send a thrown command. The second is for the closed command. There is one exception though. If you specify the thrown button to be a toggle button or level switch, the closed button will be ignored. As you see from the options drop-down list, buttons can be of type toggle, positive or negative level switches, or push buttons. Again, use the cancel field to eliminate an unused switch and click save to write the information into the yellow box to make it permanent. The next screen is for setting up signals. Also here, when a switch command in the signal address area is received, a new line for the signal is created, automatically assigning two switch addresses to it. You can then define LEDs and buttons the same way as we did for switches. But when doing this, I ran into a problem. My test layout does not have any signals. So I decided to stop the development of the yellow box for the moment and use the next probably two videos to come up with a simple signal system based on the same type of LEDs 
like I used in the CTC panel. When done, I plan to come back to the yellow box and do the ABS and CTC control modes. So here is the summary of what I have tried to achieve in this video. To make a device like the yellow box universal, program code and application data needs to be completely separated so that it is possible to change the application data without changing the program code. JSON appears to be a suitable description tool for the application data. It is relatively simple and, if necessary, can be read by humans. Of course, a computer-based tool for configuration makes things much easier. And thanks to WebSocket technology and connection, it is possible to emulate the yellow box in real time in the browser so that the user can see the effects of configuration changes immediately on the CTC panel. I hope this video gave you an idea about how flexible the yellow box finally is going to be and that the complexity of setting it up for a specific layout situation is relatively low thanks to auto detection and immediate visual feedback. As mentioned, my next step is now adding a simple signaling system to my test layout so that signal output is not just data and loconate commands but actual signal heads that are changing aspects. If you like this video, please click the like button below and consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching and see you next time.